I've doubled down on the idea, which perhaps I stated last time we spoke and perhaps not, but I certainly believe that our state of mind and body at any point in time is strongly dictated by our state of mind and body in the hours and days prior to that. And on the one hand, people are going to hear that and say, well, duh, you know, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to feel like garbage. And if you're well rested, you'll feel great. That's kind of the top contour of it. Mm -hmm. But when one looks at the neuroscience, for instance, of sleep, you start to realize that, you know, the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that you're going to get in any 90 minute bout of sleep, because your sleep is broken up into these 90 minute segments, more or less, is strongly dictated by the ratio of slow wave sleep, aka deep sleep and rapid eye movement sleep that you had in the previous 90 minute bout. And then when you start to look at the research in terms of waking states, you start to find that your ability to be focused, say for a bout of work in the morning or the afternoon, or a creative brainstorm session, or I don't know, to maybe drill into some personal issue that you're dealing with during therapy or just on a walk or while journaling is not a square wave function. You know, none of us should sit down and expect ourselves to just drop into that state. Mm -hmm. Much of our ability to move into that state effectively, whatever effective means, right? Whatever the target or goal of that bout, as I'm calling it, is, is going to be dictated by what happened in the previous moments and hours. And so when I zoom out from that, what I've doubled down on is this idea that there are just a core set of foundational things that we have to re-up every 24 hours. You know, I think thanks to the incredibly hard work of Dr. Matt Walker at Berkeley, mm -hmm. right? The sleep diplomat on Twitter, right? It's such a great name because it's so appropriate. I mean, a decade ago or so, you know, it was like, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That was the, the dominant mentality out there. And yeah, sleep's great, but you know, getting stuff done is more important. I mean, Matt has really impressed on everybody that our mental health, our physical health, and our ability to perform is so strongly dependent on our ability to get quality sleep. Maybe not every night of our life. I, I mean, we have to be realistic, but that sleep is vital. So a hat tip is insufficient. So sleep is critical, but sleep is just one of about, I would say five things that really set the, the buoyancy or the foundation upon which our nervous system is able to accomplish these transitions that I'm talking about at all. Mm -hmm. And those five things are sleep, right? In the absence of quality sleep over two or three days, you're just gonna fall to pieces. In the presence of quality sufficient sleep over two or three days, you're gonna function at an amazing level. There's a gain of function and a loss of function there. It's mm -hmm. not just if you sleep poorly, you function less well. You sleep better, you function much better. Mm -hmm. So sleep, I would say, is at the top of the list. Nutrients, you know, and there are, you can think macronutrients, and so your carnivores are only eating meat, and your vegans are only eating plants, and your, your omnivores, which is I think probably 90% of the world is eating a combination of those. But, you know, quality nutrients, I think that when I look at all of the nutrition literature and arguments out there, it seems that everyone can agree on one thing, which is that probably 80% or more of our nutrition should come from unprocessed or minimally processed sources. Minimally processed would require some cooking, but could survive on the shelf as opposed to packaged foods or highly palatable foods. So you've got sleep, nutrients, but then we should also put in micronutrients. And this is where maybe we'll get into a discussion about supplementation. I think that there's supplementation or supplements is a bit of a misnomer because it implies vitamin supplements. And people say, well, can't you get all that from food mm -hmm. or that Whey protein, isn't that just food? Wouldn't you be better off with a chicken breast? Okay, well then when you talk about convenience and the, you know, absorption, okay. But then there's this huge category of things ranging from the kind of esoterically named things like ashwagandha and shilaji and tongali and fadoji agrestis, I mean, right? I mean, it sounds all exactly all the herbal <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. But you're not gonna get that from food. Yeah, totally. So should we call them supplements at all? Yeah. So let's just say the second thing is nutrients and that includes macronutrients and that includes micronutrients as well. Mm -hmm. So those two things. Then the third would be movement. Right. And this has also been an enormous transition in the last, I think, just five years, which is not just for people interested in bodybuilding or powerlifting or for competitive athletes, but now it seems everybody, including the elderly, understand that you need a combination of cardiovascular exercise and you need resistance training, whether or not it's with body weight or weights or machines, et cetera, that you need both. I mean, not a week goes by without seeing an article in one of the major publications out there, standard media, let's call it traditional media. We'll be nice to them. Traditional media. <laughs> that highlights some studies showing that, you know, resistance training in elderly people can offset Alzheimer's or, you know, or that as our friend Peter Atia has pointed out so many times that many of the end of life creating injuries are due to people, older people stepping down the eccentric movements. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so you need movement. That's the third category. Fourth, I will argue, and I like to think that maybe I've helped this movement, if you want to call it that, is light. In particular, mm -hmm. sunlight in the early part and throughout the middle of the day and trying to minimize the amount of artificial light that you're exposed to in the evening and late night hours, most of the time, because you have to live life. Just fundamental. And then the last category that's important is social connection, aka relationships. Let's just call it relationships because that can include relationship to self. Mm -hmm. So those things set up the core foundation. And I think one way to think about them is just as a list. 
Another is to think about them in terms of a, of a schedule basis. And that's how I've really doubled down is I realize that every 24 hours, I need to invest something into each one of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, or even two years ago, I used to think, okay, like what's the workout split or how am I going to eat for the next couple of months? You know, what am I trying to optimize for? Is it muscle? Is it fat loss? Is it just maintaining? Is it energy? Is it focus? That's all fine and good, but sleep, nutrients, exercise, light relationships, those really establish the foundation of what I consider to be all of the elements that create our ability to move as seamlessly as possible between the states that we happen to be in and the states we desire to be in. Mm -hmm. And when I zoom out and I think about what are the major struggles that I, and it seems most everyone deals with, it's like how to get more focused. Okay. So we can talk about, you know, what do you take? What's the supplement, you know, but you have to say, well, how are you sleeping? Have you done any exercise? You really always find yourself or I find myself taking 10 steps back and then moving through the sequence of five things before you can even begin to talk about whether or not taking three or 600 milligrams of alpha GPC and how often to do that and does it work? And yes, it works, et cetera. But those things really set the foundation. And so I like to think of those five things every single day. You have to re-up on sleep every 24 hours or try to. You have to re-up on movement every 24 hours. You can go a day or so immobile, but you better move the next day, right? Mm -hmm. And ideally you're moving seven days a week. Doesn't necessarily mean trained to failure and running marathon seven days a week. You can Goggins your life or you can not. Goggins your life. For those of you who don't know, I'm referring to David Goggins there, by the way, who seems to never stop moving. Although I just learned meditates two hours every night, yeah. every night. And I'm inclined to believe when he says that, that he <laughs> yeah. does that. You need nutrients, even if they come from stored sources, even if you're going to fast, you're going to fast for a day or two. Okay, fine. I've done that. I know you've done that. He's, I would put hydration under nutrients too. Mm -hmm. So you can derive nutrients from stored fat, protein, et cetera, glycogen. Light, you're going to need that every 24 hours. You're going to need sunlight, even if through cloud cover. And you're going to want to avoid bright artificial lights at night, not every night, but most nights of your life. And then that relationships one is the one that maybe we can go into in a little bit more depth at some point, but it requires focus. It requires attention every 24 hours. Hmm. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you have to see friends, talk to friends, text friends every 24 hours. Some people are far more introverted than others, but then you're working on your relationship to yourself in that solo time. And hopefully when you're spending time with others as well, that has some internal repercussions. So if I've doubled down on anything, it's the understanding that there is no so-called optimization. There is no real interest, at least from me, in trying to layer in other things unless I'm paying attention to each and every one of those things every 24 hours. You have to re-up on each and every one of those five things every 24 hours. And if you don't, you can get by for a day or two, but pretty soon you're going to hit that wall where you won't be able to do any of the things that most people are actually seeking to do. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say about that is, you know, I think people hear a list of those five things and they think, gosh, okay, well, that must be nice for you, Andrew and Tim. You know, you wake up, you look at sunlight, you guys don't have kids, you know, like you don't have to worry about kids running around. You don't have to, you know, you can exercise. There are ways of layering in the, the protocols that re-up, as I'm referring to it, these five things every 24 hours that also include other people in your life, kids, pets, et cetera. Exercise certainly can include that as well. But I would argue that there is no showing up properly for yourself and for the other people in your life, unless these things are being handled. And it's not about becoming soft and cushy. It's about becoming quite resilient and effective. And I think this for me is the, it seems so simple, but as our friend Paul Conti said to me recently, he said, you know, after all the analysis and pouring through things and the complicated notions of the subconscious, he's a psychiatrist after all, you know, in the end, really great mental health is about simple practices, like first principles of self-care. So to which I raised my hand and said, well, like, what is a first principle of self-care? I'm a biologist after all. And he said, aha, it's basically the things that we were just talking about. It's those five things. And so I, I'm doubling down, I'm tripling down on those as essential to the point where nothing else really happens for very long unless those five things are tended to.